Thank you very much for those uh, warm words of welcome. Let me also pay my respects to the Ghana people. The Ghana people, of course, were extraordinary astronomers and have left us with some wonderful stories of the stars. I wanted to acknowledge the Attorney General. Thank you for your kind words. I was super impressed that you are now starting to learn a bit more about space law, so uh, inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Uh, Michael Waite from Shoal. Thank you, um, Mike Carms as well from KPNG for your sponsorship. It's great to, to have you supporting events like this. Uh, Hamilton Calder, thank you for the support of, uh, of CEDA, a very important organisation throughout uh, this country. Um, Julia Mitchell and I have met uh, before uh, and it's great to have CITAL uh, here represented. Flavia, um, we will uh, we'll be on the panel together and, uh, and Nikita Salisi from uh, Shoal as well. Today I wanted to do something that I don't normally do uh, in public presentations and that is I wanted to, to take you back to some of the stories and challenges that we encountered was setting up an agency literally from scratch and a blank uh, piece of paper. I thought that I might uh, just take you at the end on a short journey to, uh, to the moon and Mars and also share um, some early thoughts on our plans as the Prime Minister has announced that Australia will join the United States on the return to the moon and on to Mars. So let me just start at the beginning. So the agency's only 16 months old, so I sort of go back 16 months. There was only two of us, myself and Anthony Murford, who's the deputy uh, of the agency. And, um, and we had to establish the purpose, the values, uh, the strategy, the charter of, the, of a new organisation. And I can recall at the time we kind of had a utopia like moment in kind of going on in the back of our heads and so, so Australia is going to have a new space agency. Oh, yes, that's, uh, that's right. Uh, the government has announced that Australia will have a new space agency today. Oh, so what will it do? Oh, we're not quite sure what it will do yet, but, uh, but we know we want one. Oh, oh, we do? Oh, yeah, well, New Zealand's got one. Um, <laughs> So we haven't quite worked out what we'll do. And we had this kind of, we're the ones who have to, have to figure that out. Now, nations establish space agencies for different reasons. Some of them to demonstrate global superiority in, in technology and, and think of you know, the efforts of the United States, of Russia, or of China. Others to inspire their countries uh, as India and Israel um, have been doing. In Australia's case, the government's purpose was actually crystal clear and that was to really diversify our economy and create jobs that really weren't available in, in this country. And so we set the purpose of the agency to transform and grow a globally respected Australian space agency and industry. We could not do that without partners. We knew as a country we can only do this um, by leveraging the partnerships that we have around the world. And we wanted to make sure that we were also inspiring and improving the lives of every Australian. So bringing what we were doing from space back to improve what we were doing here on, on Earth. This is the most commercially focused purpose of any space agency in the world. And our values, we had to think about um, those aspects of our, uh, of our values. Because right at the beginning, if you know your purpose and you know how you're going to do things, the rest can, uh, can come along. We know we needed Australia to be a responsible citizen in space and over time to grow to be a responsible citizen in our region as we built trust. It's, it's difficult to get to space and we've seen through the history that we wanted to be safe on Earth. We wanted to be safe getting from Earth to space. It was very difficult. Safe in space, safe getting back through the atmosphere and safe on Earth. So being responsible, safe and secure was so important um, to us. We also knew that Australia had the ideas. We have this kind of can-do attitude so beautifully expressed here in, uh, in South Australia. We wanted to showcase that Australia really can do this and get our ideas back. As the Attorney General said, we were right there in the 60s. We were right there as one of the First Nations. And I think deep in our hearts, across the nation, we know we should be there again. And, uh, and so we wanted to tap into that entrepreneurship. We wanted to build a diverse team that could run through the legs of giants. We have a lot to catch up, as the Attorney General 
um, quite uh, clearly um, it told us. And so we know we needed to do that. When you have a blank piece of paper, we've simply said our agency would be diverse from top to bottom, 50-50 from day one, um, and which is something we have done from at every level in the organisation. So our values really needed, I think, to, to showcase what we were doing. As a newcomer to this, with many agencies established out there forming the partnerships, if we didn't do what we said we would do, we would simply not build the trust that was needed for us to enter. Now I'll show our, um, so this was our purpose, transform and, and grow a globally respected Australian space industry. Now, sometimes if you go on to Twitter feed that can get a little negative, it really can bring your day down. But I had one experience where I was reading the Twitter feed, we were working out our purpose. And, uh, and the Twitter feed went as far as, oh, well, you know, we're going to see this. They're going to grow the space industry. Oh, but for goodness sake, you know, can't we just transform the industry? Let's not. And we were right in the middle of doing our purpose. I thought, oh, that's actually quite good, really. Um, so took the, I don't know who the person was, but uh, they, they've now been embedded into our purpose because it, I think it summed it up. We weren't just there to grow. We wanted a complete transformation around, um, around the whole, whole nation. In terms of our values now, I've talked about responsible. We wanted to um, have our partnerships shared vision. But right down the end, you'll see passion. Now, actually, the original version of this was we do cool things, which the students will appreciate. We're a space agency. And it made it all the way through the approval process and up, back and forwards. And it got <laughs> crossed out at the last minute. So you'll see passion. But to us, it still do cool things. Um, but it, did, it didn't survive the Prime Minister's office. Um, <laughs> And our values really thread through everything we do. Um, and we hope that, that we can look back in 60 years' time. I certainly will be, won't be here, but, but looking back, nothing would make me happier to know that we never lost an Australian getting to space, in space, or coming back. Something so simple. Um, but you know, we look at the record that Qantas has. We look at the record that the Australian Antarctic Division has of not losing any of their staff in Antarctica. So then, of course, um, going back to our utopia moment, we did actually have to figure out not just what we were doing, not just how we were going to do it, but what was our strategy to get, to, um, to get there. And one of the things that we needed to do was engage the nation. A lot of people, particularly in government, think that all you need to do is convince government of the merit of your policies and strategies, but actually for longevity in the nation, you need to do something more. And that is, you have to have the support of the kitchens and lounge rooms of the nation. And if you don't have that, then how can you expect to have support from your government? So we did set out to engage the nation. And we set our goal, so I can sort of share this with you. We set our goal, thinking, well, if we engage with five million Australians in our first year, that's one in five, that's not so bad, hear about the agency, see, hear, read about what we do, that would be a good goal. We blew past that goal in the first few weeks, so it wasn't such a good one. Um, and we've now had engagement of over 110 million Australians. What it meant was every state, every territory, every, every demographic was seeing, hearing and engaging around what the agency was doing several times. I know there's not 110 men in Australia. So for the students, if that question is on your exams next week, it's not 110 men in Australians. So this was part of getting, um, getting the country uh, behind us. And I, I actually think the capacity to inspire this nation surprised us, uh, and, and we don't take that for granted. Um, I, was, uh, I was with our first international meeting in, in Germany and we had for the first time the Australian booth and you know, it was just going off. It was absolutely going off. Aussies finally had somewhere to hang around and ours was definitely the hang around place and it stood out. There's all these you know, thousands and thousands of people and, uh, and, it, and then we served wine. It wasn't South Australian wine. Um, in fact, it wasn't even Australian wine. We couldn't get our act together for that. But we were serving wine and... Uh, and everybody came, and then the head of the UK Space Agency closed the UK booth. They just said, well, it's no point, right, because everyone's over there. And they came and joined us, and he took me aside and he said to me, I don't have the nation behind me. And he says, you clearly 
you know, there's something happening here in Australia. So I think um, that is that is truly wonderful. Uh, I think for all, for all of us, the you know, looking back, I think the other thing we needed to do was engage the states and territories. If you're going to transform an industry, if you're going to grow an industry from three billion, three to four billion as it is now, to 12 billion and generate 20,000 new jobs for some of the students that are here, you can't do that from Canberra. You have to do that out in the states and territories. And I look back 16 months on, and, and I think one of the things that we did that helped with that is every 12 weeks, we did a roadshow to all states and territories. And we just kept going back, reminding of what was happening, learning from them, and, uh, and getting the states and territories involved and the premiers involved. Of course, um, the premier here of South Australia uh, was, has just been so enthusiastic and, uh, and wonderfully supportive um, of us. Here in South Australia, we, we have our headquarters. We will have the Discovery Centre for the public, which, which you'll be able to access um, coming in off the terrace. We'll also have Mission Control. And our, our vision is that we will have live feed to the International Space Station, to what's happening on the Moon and Mars, for people to be able to drop in and see, for kids to be able to see what's happening and, and know that that's happening in real time. I was lucky enough to see um, some, some live feed to the International Space Station, and there was an astronaut floating around trying to fix something, and he's got mission control on the ground in his ear. He's got a map, and he's going, is it the green wire or the blue wire? And, <laughs> And I think for an electrical apprentice to actually see that would have been um, extraordinary. I, I think he got the wire right, but uh, um, really quite extraordinary. We also knew that if you're going to grow an industry, it's not just the role of government. It's really starting to attract in the investment that's required in this country. So we set ourselves the goal of stimulating $2 billion of capital investment in the space sector. And a couple of years ago, that was negligible this country, and, uh, and we figured if half of that, so a billion dollars of that was inbound capital from industry, from other space agencies, then we would truly start to generate some momentum uh, that would ultimately lead to new jobs uh, for these projects. I, I'm really pleased to say that already that pipeline is 1.4 billion and half of that is inbound capital, and it includes the investment in R&D. So uh, we are making some, uh, some progress. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, the plans for Moon to Mars. And in October this year, as I said, the Prime Minister announced that we would again join the United States on their Artemis mission to, uh, to the Moon uh, and also on to Mars. And to go... Um, I'm going to skip over those. To, to go back to the moon and to go on to Mars, there's a couple of things that, um, that you need. First of all, you need a really large rocket that can start to take the sort of payloads um, that you need. And in our agreement with, uh, with, with NASA, this is funding $150 million over five years that will come to industry and research here in this country. And we will do a series of things. One, we will support companies to enter into this international supply chains for these missions. We will start demonstrator projects that can showcase those fantastic ideas of Australia and get them qualified and, and um, operating on orbit so that those companies and researchers can really start moving up to the next level. And then we wanted one or two projects that really put the Australian flag up there alongside our colleagues and that's what, uh, what we'll be doing. So the first step, as I said, if you're going back to, to the moon onto Mars, is you need some big, big rocket. The space launch system uh, will be the largest, one of the largest rockets we've ever seen. You will feel the liftoff if you are three kilometres away. You'll feel it deep in your chest. This is going to be a massive rocket. But importantly, it can take 26 tonnes of payload because now we're going to have to start building things. Because we're not just going to the moon to come back and come back to Earth, going to the moon to stay, going to Mars to, uh, to stay. So this is the Artemis mission that we will be joining. So just give you a very quick flavour for that. And obviously you need to stage it in to prove your technology. Uh, the first thing we'll do is uh, the first human spacecraft uh, will go. So there's the, we'll have the Orion capsule for six astronauts on the front and just Take that around, no humans in it, but just make sure everything, everything works. The next step will be to put 
the astronauts in that capsule and just to orbit the moon. That orbit of the moon will, will take uh, astronauts for the first time um, further from Earth than they have ever been and make sure that all of that works. The next piece is to start to build out on the lunar orbiter its power system, human habitat system, as well as a landing system to go back down to the moon. And then by Artemis III, a crewed mission, first woman, next man, will go down to the moon. And they will land near the lunar south pole. And the reason for that I'll get into is, uh, is water. Now, I got caught the other day because I was talking about landing in the South Pole and doing da-da-da, and I had forgot to mention that it was lunar and I was in a, quite a serious meeting in Parliament. And someone said, why would NASA want us to go to Antarctica? <laughs> and, and I said, no, no, not that South Pole. The South Pole of the Moon. When you get, do this every day, you do forget those things. You'll see on the bottom of that diagram that the plan is also to start having commercial payloads. Some of these contracts have been let to start look at how we have cargo on the moon and to start um, having habitat as well on the moon. And I'll explain why we're going to the South Pole. Phase two um, still being developed. This is really now how do we use the moon to test all the things that need to be tested that will be done on Mars. How do we get fuel from water? How do we set up habitation? How do we genuinely live um, and use the resources on, on the moon? And that's Artemis 4 through to Artemis 7. So I'm, I'm a geologist by training. And given that we as a country are going back to the moon and onto Mars, the very first thing that you need to do when you're a geologist is you get a map. And you don't get a normal map, you get a topo map. So given that you're all going to have to learn a lot more about the moon and Mars, I thought we might as well start that lesson straight away um, because you'll be hearing a lot about this. So, um, so stick, uh, stick with me. One of the reasons that landing on the South Pole is the search for water. So there's the landing sites both on the moon and Mars are really designed around the search for water. We need water to live, but we need water to separate to have hydrogen and oxygen uh, for the use of fuel. Near side, that's the side of the moon that we see. We don't call it the dark side, it's called the far side, because it's actually not always dark. Um, and that's the part of the moon that we don't see. What I want you to focus on is just the colour here in the topography. So white is, is sort of plus seven kilometres. Um, the, the, the deeper blue purple is minus um, six kilometres. That's 13 kilometres of topographic difference. And the reason I share that is if you went from the Mariana Trench, the deepest trench on Earth, to the top of Everest, that's only 18 kilometres. So there is extraordinary topography. All those things you see where the moon is flat, there's extraordinary topography. You will not be driving your moon buggy down some of those craters, I can tell you. Um, and during the Apollo missions, when I went to school, the moon was dry and it was flat. Now, they wanted it to be dry because they didn't want the astronauts to catch anything from microbes that were living in water that they didn't know about. But actually, we now think there is water on the moon. And that was only discovered in 2013. So Laddie, one of the missions um, orbiting the moon, noticed that there were plumes of water vapour. Didn't quite understand why they were periodic, and then noticed they coincided with meteor showers and big meteorites. So the, the theory is that there is water sitting below the surface that is released uh, when a meteor hits, or a large asteroid hits the surface of the moon, and that's what the return mission to the moon will look to prove and look to try and extract 100 to 200 tonnes of water. This is Mars. Next topo map. Stick with me. I think this is absolutely amazing. And of course, what now that you're used to this, the colour scheme here, the first thing you notice is the, the Tarsus Montes, those three mountains there shown, and they are extraordinary. And then you look to the to, to the upper uh, left corner and you'll see Olympus Mons. Olympus Mons is 20 two kilometres high. Now I told you the biggest extent we have on Earth is 18 kilometres. This is one of the biggest um, structures known in our solar system and, uh, and certainly way bigger than any uh, volcano that we have. But I'm getting a bit distracted with my um, topo map here. Actually we're looking for water. So, um, so now go to that little um, arrow there which is the Cyrenian Fosso. This may be on your exam. Kids, Fosso is just a fancy word for canyon, so I'm hoping that's on the English exam um, sometimes next week. This is what's happening in that 
crater. So this is um, a crater in, uh, in that canyon. And if you look at the blue there, at a certain layer, there appears to be um, briny water that is flowing on the moon, uh, on Mars. And, uh, and so the expeditions will be going to try and extract that. So just, I wanted to finish off with what's, you know, what's the role here that Australia and South Australia can play. As South Australia is already one of the hottest places for startups, for companies to come and engage. Citadel's um, come here. You can see already what's happening with the internships. This is this is it's really starting to happen here, and uh, we're seeing 135% growth in SMEs in space in the last few years. We're seeing 65% growth in companies, international companies coming to establish themselves here for, for space. So there's really starting to see that growth. There's three areas I just want to highlight. The next area of communication for us on Earth and in space will be the combination of light and radio spectrum. So we need more and more bandwidth, just like kids. You just need more and more and more and more bandwidth. Um, and the next jump of bandwidth beyond radio spectrum is using light, using photons. Uh, and so Australia has a role to play in the laser communication network that will be established between the moon and the earth. What's extraordinary about helping to establish that high communication, high frequency network to help control the robots is that that will transform the way we communicate here on earth. For a country that is an island, for a country that you don't have to drive too far north, that you cannot use your mobile phone, this is really, really critical for us. Um, as I mentioned, this that this time we're returning to the moon to stay and set up habitation. Australia leads the world in autonomous drilling, in remote asset management, what happens here in South Australia, and we want to bring our expertise to the table to um, support that. Just this week, NASA announced that it's partnering with the Australian Antarctic Division to trial a robot below the, the ice, so trundling along underneath um, the ice, sort of in the water, but but walking, if you like, upside down. Um, and that will be a trial for the Europa Clipper mission um, where they're hoping to take a robot like that down into the ice off one of Jupiter's moons. The third area for us will be we are really good at taking satellite data, and it's great the, the interns are working on that. Um, we're really good at this country of putting that into a kind of cube of data uh, better than any other country. Geoscience Australia does this work, and uh, we would love to do the data cube for the moon and Mars. Because I go back to when, when we were exploring to find the Americas, or even when the exploration um, to, to many waves of exploration to come down uh, to this southern part of, of the world. And who had the maps, uh, definitely it made a difference. So look, we will work very hard to make sure that Australia and Australian ideas and technology are showcased out there. But what really is driving us is to be able to make sure that we're giving jobs to the kids and grandkids um, of this nation in a, complete, in a sector that right now they can't fully participate in. Thank you very much.